Well, kind of keeping in the rhythm of what goes on in our culture, the new year, <clears throat> um, there's the general idea going around right now that you need to change something, right? It's uh, New Year's and resolutions, and I don't know how many of you make resolutions. Uh, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Um, it's kind of really, um, I'm not knocking resolutions, but you stop and think about it, that there's just one time a year when you go, God, what do I need to change? <laughs> it's, it's kind of a strange thing even worldwide that, that worldwide the, the calendar year rolls around and then people go, oh, another year is gone, and wait, I'm, I need to change something in my life, so this is what I'm going to change. It's not all bad, but I just think it's just kind of strange. Um, according to the University of Scranton, uh, they did the top 10 resolutions. And, uh, of course, the number one is lose weight. Uh, number two is getting organized. That kind of uh, surprised me a little bit that we're so disorganized that what organization is above some things, and I thought that was kind of strange. Spend less, save more is number three. Enjoy life to the fullest. Uh, it's kind of vague. Uh, number five, staying fit and healthy. I thought that would have been higher than getting organized, but maybe not. Learn something exciting. Okay, now that's, that's, that's really giving up a lot. You're going to learn something exciting this year, right? Yeah. I, I think I could do that. Quit smoking down there at number seven, all right? Help others in their dreams. Uh, and number nine, fall in love. I, I, that just blew me away. Here's a resolution for this year is that you're going to go out and fall in love. Like, you can control that. You know, I'm, I'm bound to determined I'm going to fall in love this year. And number 10, spend more time with family. Okay. Percent of Americans who usually make New Year's resolutions, 45%. Almost half of us will make a resolution or have made one already. Uh, amount of uh, the percentage of people who never make resolutions, 38%. So 38% of us say, never, I never do it, I never make a resolution. A number, the percentage of people that keep their resolutions, 8%. 8% is you'll find from one year to the next have kept their resolutions. So that number is real. Not real high, and I don't want to discourage us there, but the reality is it's, it's a difficult thing to change. You know, it really is change is difficult for a human being. And people who explicitly make resolutions, in other words, if, they, if you tell somebody else about your resolution, you know that, it, that the chances of you keeping that resolution are ten times greater than if you keep it a secret. So if you made a resolution and you really want to do it, then just tell everybody, this is what I'm doing, you know, I'm... So uh, that helps. But today, we may or may not have made resolutions or have some ideas, at least in mind, on how we might want to change some things in the future. And I, I, I just want to go through a few Proverbs today and hear um, what God says about the danger of what I would call being stuck. And we all get stuck in different areas of life at, and, and more serious things and some things not so serious, but I think you know what I mean by being stuck. You just be kind of just kind of stall out and you just go on and on and on. And and I am a master at being stuck. Um, not metaphorically in life, but getting things stuck. I mean, I, I Nina will, uh, I think, agree that I can get almost anything stuck because I have this desire to drive vehicles places where nobody else has gone, okay? And it doesn't even need to be a four-wheel drive vehicle. I'll take any vehicle, you know, eh, there's a little water standing there, but I think if I go fast, you know, I can get through it. And man, in my life, and uh, I've gotten stuck in so many places, four-wheel drive pickup trucks, you know how it is. You, you think I can go anywhere, so you try to go through the mud, and you're going through the mud and then it starts bogging down and you finally stop. And you know what that means is the tire is lower than the mud, so you put it in reverse and you try to back up. You can't quite get out. So you think, well, I've got a little momentum. I'll go forward. So you go forward again. You go down just a little bit deeper until you're into that, you know, reverse forward, reverse drive, reverse drive. I can just rock in that thing back and forth. And it just settles it down deeper, deeper, deeper into the mud until the carriage, the undercarriage of your truck is sitting on the mud and you've got four tires that are just sitting on here spinning. You've seen this. Now, I, now I've, 
I've given this ability over to one member of my family that will remain unnamed, but uh, none of my family's here today except for Nina, but you, you know who has gotten this, this ability. So now I have always carry a, you know, one of those uh, yellow snap ropes or whatever you call them in the back of my truck because I pull his truck out a lot. Okay, he'll remain a name, but I, you know, it's just going back and forth and finally you get so you just can't move anymore. And, and that's what being stuck is in life, is you just get to that point where you're just spinning your tires and you're not going anywhere and you go, okay, I'll just leave it here. I'll just leave this sucker here, you know. Uh, eventually this ground will dry up or it'll freeze up and we'll drive it out. It's so easy to, to let uh, entropy um, creep in. And entropy is a, a technical physics term that, that says that everything that's left to itself will has a tendency to deteriorate. So, so this is what I would call, you know, in layman's terms, the, the pump and the water uphill thing. If you ever stop, it just all comes back down. And it, in, in physics, it constantly takes in energy. And if you don't give it energy, then it begins to deteriorate. And when you become apathetic or complacent uh, about something, then that's entropy. And we get stuck. We just can't move forward. And we, you know, we go out and we, we buy the, the exercise clothes and, and we get, you know, all that stuff. And we get the app on our phone and we get the, the DVD and we do well for about two weeks. And then, you know, you get a cold or you get the flu for the weekend and you stop. And then you look back about two months from there and there's the clothes and the DVD and the app. And it's like, what happened? Well, I just kind of got stuck. The hope begins to slip away, and, and, and then something really bad sets in, and we, we learn to settle for life as it is, and it becomes the new normal. It's, it's not a great life, but you can accept it, and you just give up. You just get stuck. Being stuck, entropy, gradual deterioration of life is the enemy of an abundant life. And it happens to all of us in, in different areas. So I want to go through a proverb for us. This is Proverbs uh, 24, 30 to 34. And the writer here says, I went past the field of the sluggard, past the vineyard of the man who lacks judgment. Thorns had come up everywhere. The ground was covered with weeds and the stone wall was in ruins. I applied my heart to what I observed and learned a lesson from what I saw. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a bandit and scarcity like an armed man. Now the writer here uh, gives us God's insight on the condition of being stuck, of losing our purpose, losing our, our motivation, uh, uh, of, of settling for just a gradual but uh, deterioration of life. And he says that he went past the vineyard of a sluggard. Now, that sounds kind of bad, you know, to call somebody a sluggard. I don't really think he's calling the man a name. He's just, uh, you know, describing the condition of his life. But you know what a slug is. You know, don't, don't you, a slug is that, you know, slimy little gross thing. I don't even know what species or family that it's in. Somebody could tell me. But it, it leaves that trail of slime across the sidewalk when you come out of the morning. If you ever step on one in your bare feet, it just, you know, it's like the heebie-jeebies or whatever you get. And they're just terrible. So 12 times in Proverbs, the writer refers to the sluggard. And this is his term for someone who is just apathetic and, and just stuck and, and just lets things go. And he sees this vineyard and he notices that it's overgrown with weeds. And, you know, vineyards are usually very beautiful things and the walls are falling down. And, you know, that takes a while for that to happen. That doesn't happen in vineyards just immediately. And vineyards take a lot of work. We're starting to have some vineyards here in Kentucky since tobacco has, has, has bombed. And now we've got vineyards different places. And if you've ever been to one of those for a, a wedding or event, or that's mainly what they're doing right now, you notice how beautiful they are. And it just takes a long time, a, a lot of work, continual maintenance. And vineyards don't just happen. They don't just take care of themselves. 
And to understand the angst behind this proverb, to understand what we're dealing with today, you have to understand that in the ancient Middle East, to own property was rare and it really meant something. And we take, we take owning property as rather normal in America. But in the ancient Middle East, most of them were nomads, and to own a vineyard really meant that you had been blessed with something. So entropy, you know, this, this neglect, starts with the failure to comprehend that this is my one and only chance at existence here on this planet, is this vineyard. Everybody gets a vineyard, you see. Everybody that's born gets a vineyard by God. Uh, when you were born, you got a vineyard. You may not know that, metaphorically. You got a body. You got a mind. You, you got your will. You got some relationships. You, you got probably some financial resources. They might have been minimal from your parents, but you got some financial resources, and you got a chance to do something with good work. We as Americans were all given a vineyard, and we have the freedom to work here. Everybody was given something at birth. You received the ability, you received a soul, you received the ability to hear God and to speak and have God hear you in prayer. It's, it's a great vineyard. It's a great ability. It's the opportunity of a lifetime. And I, I don't even have to care for it on my own. God says, I'm a partner with you. I've given you this vineyard. I've given you uh, this, this existence. And I want to partner with you. I, I want to help you. You see, God never forces anyone to uh, take care and, and take action on their vineyard. Uh, we all have the freedom to let our lives just kind of metaphorically grow up in weeds. And to do that, we don't need to do anything. We just let it happen. We just do nothing. And, and life deteriorates. We get stuck. So the writer of this proverb says, I was walking past a vineyard and I thought of what it might have been. He, he sees this vineyard and, he, and, he, and his mind's going, wow, this could have been a beautiful thing. This could have been a, a beautiful life. They could have had some, some great wine come out of this vineyard for everybody to enjoy. They could have some great gifts come out of this person for everybody to, to receive. And the, and the writer wonders why. I mean, was there some kind of a catastrophe? Was there a drought? Was there a flood? Was there a fire? Did something terrible happen in this person's life? No, it was just... He says, just sure negligence on the part of the owner of the vineyard. Uh, the, the vineyard owner had no idea what he had. He was throwing away the opportunity of a lifetime, and that's the strange power of entropy, of being stuck. It's just sheer neglect. It's, it's missing the gift. And you know, folks, in, in, in some way, every person has missed their gift. None of us really understand what God has given us. We all miss it some. Some of us may get it more than others, but all, none of us can comprehend what God has given us. And now, tell me if you know this person. I created this hypothetical person. We'll call him Sluggy. Okay, Sluggy's a great guy, and um, I like being with Sluggy, but he's not content with his work, and he feels like, he could have had a more rewarding and challenging job. And we sometimes talk about the situation. And I'll say to him, you know, you could do something about that. And he says, oh, no, no. Sluggy says he's always got a reason as to why he couldn't do anything about it. He's convinced that his, his boss, his supervisor won't uh, respect him, won't develop him. And he's convinced the organization is so political. So Sluggy says, no, I'm, I'm just going to stay where I am because it's so political and I don't get into political stuff. So 40 hours a week, Sluggy's just kind of stuck at work. He just kind of bides his time. And so we tell him, well, why don't you get another job? He goes, oh, no, that's too risky. That's way too risky, see. I can't do that. That might not work. So Sluggy has this expectation, this grandiose dream about what life's supposed to be like and what work is supposed to be like, but he won't do anything about it. So here, here's a proverb that could change Sluggy's life. Proverbs 28, 19. He who works with his land will have abundant food, but the one who chases fantasies will have his fill of poverty. Boy, 
It's so easy to get this thing in your head about this is this picture of what I see life as and I'm just going to chase, I'm going to dream that, but I never do anything about it. What the proverb is talking about is living in reality. It is saying that I must work the land that I have. I can't work somebody else's land. I can't work somebody else's vineyard. I can't work somebody else's gifts. I have to work my own gifts. It's my life, my body, and my relationships. And people have these fantasies. I, you know, I want a perfect marriage, you know, and I, I want the perfect circle of friends. I, I want the perfect career. I want the perfect education. And if I can't have that, then I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to stay stuck. So I think, first of all, we have to start with this reality. Work the land that's my land. Realize what the gifts are that God has given to me. My body, my life, my relationships, my work. Because you see, this gift, this vineyard that God has given me is all that I have. What somebody else has is none of my business because I can't do a thing about it. Now, if it's ever going to be different, it won't be because the vineyard fairy has come through and sprinkled fairy dust all over my life, see. It'll be because I've accepted what God has given me. I've partnered with him, and I have asked him to help. So, and ask, what's the next step that you want me to take? Now, let me explain the way our minds allow entropy to go unchallenged. The writer of Proverbs 6, 9 says... How long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? Verses about sluggard usually have this kind of this edge to them, you know. But it, but it's not that the writer is being cruel to sluggards. He just wants the readers, he wants you and me to see the danger of this pathway of life. How long are you going to lie there, you sluggard? When, when are you going to get up from your sleep? The words that are repeated in these verses tell us something about how sluggards justify their inactivity. Sleep, slumber, folding of the hands to rest, all pictures of inactivity and being passive. How much longer does the slugger say it's going to go on? Oh, just a little while longer, and then I'll take action. Tomorrow or a week from Thursday. And this little while turns into weeks, into months, into years and into a lifetime, unless somebody wakes us up. Yeah, I know I need to get my finances in shape uh, and get out of debt, and I've, I've always wanted to be generous, and I'm going to do that next year. Yeah, this will be the last year. This, I'm going to get it all together this year, then the next year that I'm going to do it. Or We know that we need to get our spiritual lives in shape, and yeah, I, I need to get active with some Christians As soon as things slow down, as soon as life slows down a little bit and I'm not so tired on Sunday mornings, then I'm going to get involved in that. See, the writer of Proverbs wants to sound a wake-up call, and I I hope that this happens to us. The danger is not that I say never, it's that I say tomorrow, because tomorrow never comes for most of us when we do that. The statement gives me permission to, to avoid doing what God wants me to do in my vineyard. The writer of Proverbs tells us that the sluggard specializes in making excuses. It doesn't take much of an excuse. It could be pretty flimsy. Sometimes we we justify inactivity because we tell ourselves that we're just overwhelmed and there's just so much going on and we're fatigued and that we don't have the energy to do what we ought to do. Listen to Proverbs 26. Here's another one, 26, 14. As the door turns on its hinges, so a sluggard turns on his bed. The picture of a slug on a bed is probably a good one, but the the, the sluggard is turning back and forth. You're thinking about getting up. You're thinking about doing something. You just roll over for a while. It's, you know, it's like the husband that, you know, he's just so tired. His wife says, why don't you go outside and play with the kids? And Oh, no, man, I'm beat, you know, I, I'm just too... Or why don't you go mow the grass? I mean, and it's, it's huge, it's tall. And, uh, I don't think so, man. I, I just, I'm just beat. I don't have the energy. I mean, I'm just worn out from the office. Then his phone rings, and somebody asks him to join a foursome at golf, and there's a miracle. All of a sudden, he's got all this energy. 
Now, I could have turned that around on women easily, too, but uh, we won't do that. But, but you know what I mean. We've got all these excuses as to why I don't have the energy, and then something comes up that we really want to do, and wow, I feel great all of a sudden. As sluggards, we don't see our own sluggardism. Proverbs 26, 16. The sluggard is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who answer discreetly. See, the idea here in this proverb is that in the sluggard's mind, uh, of course not us, not sluggards, but the rationale for not taking action is always stronger than wisdom. See, we never see where we are stuck. It's so difficult to see your own stuckness. And boy, let somebody else tell you that you're stuck, and, and that could be brutal for them, right? Try telling somebody else that, that they're stuck, that, that, that they're like the sluggard. It could be fatal. My guess is that a lot of people um, in our community, a lot of people that we know would say, you know, well, I have problems, but laziness is not one of them. My problem is that I'm so active. I'm so busy. I'm rushed so much. I've got this type A personality, and I'm going at it so hard. Most of us, though, suffer from this kind of selective entropy. We, we may be quite active, even hyperactive in one area of life, but there's always one vineyard that we don't take care of. There's always one area in life that we just neglect. Imagine uh, a dad who has a, I mean, he's career-minded and he's climbing and he's going strong and he's successful. And as he gets more and more successful there, his vineyard with his children, what often happens with, that, with the children? Well, they become more and more distant many times, you see. And he's, he's, he's all enthused about this vineyard of work, but this, this vineyard of relationship with his children, as they get older, he just buys them things. Or, you know, it's the couple that has what looks like everything. They've got a great house and they, they've got the material things and they've got the children and things are going great. But as time goes by, they talk to each other less and less and less and less. Or it's the, the middle-aged guy who looks okay on the outside, but whose finances are so messed up that sometimes he can't sleep at night. Most of us have one area in which we are stuck. So what do you do? The writer, again, Proverbs 6.6, 6, has some advice. He says, Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. Now, this isn't the only time that he compares the ant and the slug. Okay? Two particular lessons that we can learn from the ant. Have you ever watched a little ant? We had one in our, in our house, uh, I think it was last summer, and he had found, uh, I shouldn't tell it. No, go ahead. Uh, he, he had found a little piece of rice, and he had it, and he was trying to carry it away. And it was so amazing. You know, you, we, we didn't do anything to him because just to see this little bitty ant, this great big piece of rice, trying to carry it away, and he was struggling with it. We don't know who dropped the rice. Somebody did. But, you know, it was, it, it was just like, you know, why would I have to admire the ant? The, the, the ant does not require external motiv motivation. The ant has no boss, has no leader, no overseer. Uh, it, it knows that you're waiting around for somebody else. To, uh, it knows that if you're waiting around for someone else to give you motivation, that it never happens. If you expect your boss, if you expect your spouse, if you expect someone else to motivate you, it's never going to happen. And ants take care of the vineyard. If we were like the ant, we said, I'm responsible for my life. I'm responsible for what's been given to me. No one else. I can't blame it on anyone else for ruining my vineyard. And second, the ant understands the law of opportunity. You see, even in the summer, ants are always gathering. He stores up the provisions. Uh, maybe I wish that it wasn't summer. Maybe I'm tired. Maybe I think I should take this time off. But the only but they'll only be this age one time. Whatever season, 
And we all go through different seasons in life. But whatever season you're in right now, this is your vineyard. See, your vineyard isn't about tomorrow to take care of. Your vineyard is right now. And the writer of Proverbs says that the ants understand time better than we do. We have this one life. And gosh, it goes so fast, so unbelievably fast that we're surprised by it. And we have to go to the ant and the ant teaches us that this is the opportunity, is today, every day. So, it sounds like a lot of hard work, doesn't it? Well, here's, here's the good news in it. All right, if we're ready for the gospel, here's the good news. We may be stuck. We may look at things in our life and think, this is too much for me, I can't handle this right now. It's never too much for God. Your partner in life. You can't overwhelm him, you see. And he's waiting on you to give him that partnership. He's waiting on us to ask. The good news that Jesus says, just ask me and I'll help. I've been waiting on you to ask me. How many times have we prayed for something and then realized that God has been waiting for me to ask? All this time I've been struggling with this thing and God is just waiting for me. And then we start something, we get unstuck and we start and we take the first step and, and then it just floods in us on us. It's not that bad. It wasn't this hard, this thing that I've been struggling against. It's not that bad once that I ask him because he's been waiting this entire time for me to say, God, I'm, I'm ready. Are you ready to help? And he's got all this stored up. So here's the question. Where is God calling you to ask today? What is it? Maybe it's your work life. I don't know. You know, Paul told um, the church, he says, whatever you do, do it as like it's to the Lord. Whatever you're working at. If you're pulling weeds, pull weeds for the Lord. Right? If you're sitting at a desk, sit at a desk for the Lord. He says, whatever you do it, do, do it for the Lord. He says, I want you to do this with all your heart. Just take one step in faith and look at your job and say, God has given me this job. This is my vineyard. Lord, would you help me with it? You find all kinds of things there. Maybe your vineyard is a financial situation. Proverbs has a lot to say about finances. In Proverbs 3, the writer says, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Maybe finances are where, you know, this, you're kind of stuck. And God is saying, just trust me. Just trust me. Maybe your vineyard is your soul. Maybe your vineyard is your spiritual life. Jesus said, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and he loses his soul? Okay. Th things may be going great in your vineyard, in your career. But, but what about your heart? What about your relationship? If you take that one step towards Christ, he's got a whole plan for that. He's ready for you. Now, if you're sitting here today and you go, I don't have the slightest idea what he's talking about. Um, I don't know what vineyards and slugs have got to do with me. Well, let me help you identify where you're stuck. What do you not want to talk about? What is it that when someone brings up, you go, I don't want to talk about it? What is it when someone else brings up that you get angry about it? Okay. I'd look to that vineyard today. I think that vineyard is probably the one that's growing up in some weeds. Okay. That's, that's suffered from some neglect. Assess your vineyard, number one. And number two, ask God. He's ready to help there. He's ready to rebuild that vineyard so it produces grapes that a lot of people can enjoy. Let's, let's spend some time, a little bit of time in prayer before we go on.
to the fountain Dip your heart in the streams of life Let the pain and the sorrow Be washed away In the waves of His mercy As deep cries out